Hey y'all, it's your girl Morgan Renee Myers tuning in with you all for another story time with Morgan My Chapter looking a little long, we might have to break it up in two. Good lord. Yeah, might break this up. Um Jennifer Lewis, the mother of black Hollywood, a memoir. Let's just hop right into it. Chapter eight. Hollywood not swinging. My friend Louis St. Louis, who had been truly important to my career, came through for me in a big way. Louis was well connected in showbiz circles and invited agents from William Morris to Don't Tell Mama to see my one woman show how I spent my summer vacation. And yes, the biggest talent agency in the business signed me immediately. Finally, my big break. In short order, William Morris arranged auditions for a Broadway show, a couple of movies, and a screen test for Bonnie Timmerman, who at the time was the casting director for Universal. But I didn't get cast in anything. After I auditioned for Grind, a Broadway-bound musical starring Ben, Ver ben Vereen, the director, Hal Prince, commented I was too powerful to be real. This feedback actually made me smile. In my early days with William Morris underscored my present dilemma of not fitting into a marketable box. I was too unconventional, not commercial enough. One of my William Morris agents, Greg Mullins, told me I needed to be more glamorous. What the fuck did he mean by that? The agency sent me on several auditions for roles that I knew could take my career to the next level. I auditioned for the role of Suge in the movie The Color Purple. I was hugely disappointed that Ruben Cannon, the casting director, felt I was too young. It was sort of nice to hear that because in show business, having large breasts usually means they cast you as characters that are 10 years older than your age. Then came the audition for Saturday Night Live. In its 10 seasons on the air, Saturday Night Live had featured only one African-American woman, an actress named Yvonne Hudson. Excitement does not describe how I felt. This could be it, an opportunity to show my versatility, vocal ability, comedic content, and charisma. Nora Dunn was auditioning that same day. I must have done well because a day or so later, I got a call back and met the show's creator, Lauren Michaels. Then a few days later, my agent, Lucy Aceto, called to tell me with great compassion that I had not gotten Saturday Night Live. If one real test of a person's mental health is their ability to experience rejection and great disappointment, then, not surprisingly, I failed the test. I fell apart. I staggered to sheet metal in Central Park. As soon as I got there, I dropped to my knees, sobbing, and fell face first into the grass. Damn. That hurt. I lost control of my body, shaking, right, right, rising, and crying out. I lay there and cried until nightfall. By morning, my sorrow had turned to rage. I stormed a few blocks to the William Morris building on 55th Street, blew past the secretary, and burst into Lucy's office. Pounding on her desk, screaming and shouting blindly, I blamed the agency for misguiding me. I know I scared the shit out of everyone in the nearby offices. I was lucky William Morris didn't drop me on the spot. The Saturday Night Live role went to Demetra Vance, a talented actress who lasted through only one season. Frustrated by the stereotypical parts given her on the show, Demetra left Saturday Night Live in 1986. Although auditioning was getting me nowhere, my cabaret shows were still in great demand and provided me with a creative outlet that kept me from completely losing my mind. In the audience, one July evening at Don't Tell Mama was Bob Watt, the founder of the comic strip in New York City. Oh, now she puts it. Watt, spelled W-A-C-H-S, pronounced Wax, had discovered Eddie Murphy and Bob's other clients, Arsenio Hall and Chris Rock, were bursting onto the entertainment scene. Bob loved my show, believed in my talent, and felt that as my manager, he could take my career to new heights. Finally, my night and charming signing had arrived. There we go. Finally, my night and shining armor had arrived. I was now where I hoped to be. In audition, in addition to Bob Wax, heavy hitters including the Zappels were fighting for me. But as much of auditions rolled by without success, it still was not clear where my niche was. I did not fit on Wax, Wax's roster like the others. He knew what to do for them, but my offering was too broad and uniquely individual. Mark Brown heard me say I was going crazy waiting for my big break. He had started seeing a therapist and knew I could benefit from therapy too. But rather than doing that, we devised a new show, Jennifer Lewis on the Couch, in which I spoke to an unseen shrink and analyzed why I wasn't a star yet. David Zappel and Joanne Zappel were the producers. Backed by a full band and two muscle-bound singers, named Keith McDaniel and Craig Frawley. I opened Jennifer Lewis on the Couch at the Roundabout Theater in April. That was big. The Roundabout was a real theater, not a cabaret. 
The show was a hit with critics and audiences and even won me a spot on the Today Show where I was interviewed by Jane Pauley, who was very pregnant at the time. I wore a beautiful white suit and added some dangly gold earrings my mother had given me the Christmas before. <laughs> How so pretty. Um, let's take a commercial break for more of my creations. I made this little Santa hat, but it didn't come out how I intended. It's supposed to be lengthier, so I might have had too much tension when I was using the crochet hook, so I'm going to go for a bigger size hook the next go round. But you can follow me on Instagram and Facebook at More of My Creations. It's spelled M O R E M Y. It's a collaboration of my names put together, Morgan, Renee, Meyer. So the M O for Morgan, the R E for Renee, and the M Y for my last name, Meyer. More of my, because we more of my creations, education, reading, plant based meals, yada, yada, yada. So go tap in. Um, I'm doing a 33% off sale on everything. This is December. I turned 33 on the 26th of this month. So get your gifts, get your uh, self care, get all that. Because uh, I'm not gonna be doing all these sales all next year. I'm stepping into my work and yeah, <laughs> get a while of getting this. All right, back to this read. Ah, she was very pregnant. I wore a beautiful white suit and added some dangly gold earrings my mother had given me the Christmas before. Jane Pauly smugly. So Jennifer, are you ever going to be a star? When do you think it will happen? Um, I don't know. I guess when I'm calmer. Well, maybe it will happen when the earrings are real. Excuse me? I know this woman did not just insult me on national television. I was stunned by her rudeness. Later, I thought she must have had morning sickness or something. But fuck that. Now that I have the opportunity, let me say this. Miss Pauly, that was rude. I did become a star, and trust me, the earrings are fucking real. At the urging of Bob Wax, my new manager... I decided to move to L.A. I'd been in three Broadway shows and made a name for myself as a solo performer. Now it was time for Hollywood, for movies, TV, Oscars, and Grammys. Bob bought me a used Mazda 323, and I saved $6,000 from my Billy Salima tour to cover me during what I thought would be a brief period before I see stardom. I moved in with Roxanne Reese, who had remained a friend after the concert in Cologne at her small bungalow apartment on Truth Avenue, deep in the San Fernando Valley. Ross was working steadily in TV and as Richard Pryor's opening act. Bob put me in the hands of his assistant, Tess Haley. Right off the bat, Tess commissioned a highly respected writer named Deborah Dean Davis to create a movie script for which, for me, which Bob could shop to the studio. Although the script got no mileage, Deborah and I became bosom buddies. Bob was a powerful player whose client roster easily opened Hollywood's gate. He got me meetings with every major studio in town. Opportunities seemed to be hang seemed to be banging on my door when Bob arranged a showcase for me at the comedy store and filled the audience with Hollywood big leagues. One of these was George Schlatter, the legendary producer who had transformed American television comedy in the late nineteen sixties with Rowan and Martin's Laugh In. This this is clearly I gotta do a lot of research because a lot of these people in the shows she's mentioning I've never heard of. But also I'm thirty two and she's probably close to seven. Uh, Shatter loved me, but once again, he found me unremar unmarketable. He told me, if this was 20 years ago, you would be a star overnight. To this day, I believe this is true. Unlike the bygone 50s and 60s when multi-talented performers like Flip Wilson, Carol Burnett, and Jackie Gleason rang, show business in the 80s was designed to market artists who fit in a simple box. Comic or singer or actor or sexy starlet. And I was all of those. Yet, I persisted. I cast my net wider, auditioning for the movie Beetlejuice to be a VJ on VH1 for a Fritos commercial and for a CBS series called Silence. I was rejected over and over. Bob set up meetings with Paramount, Columbia Pictures, and Lorimar, the highly successful company that produced Dallas, Knott's Landing, and Falcon Crest. After the meeting at Paramount, I was driving off the studio lot when I saw Chris Rock walking in the blazing California sun. I pulled up and, like back home in the Midwest, leaned out the car window and asked, Want to ride, Negro? We acted a fool in my little white Mazda until I dropped him off at his hotel. I auditioned for the lead in Clara's Heart, but Woody got the role. I auditioned for a role in the movie Scrooge, and all I got for that was felt up by crazy-ass Bill Murray. All in good fun, but I got the hell out of there. I also met several times with Ralph Bakshi, whose film Fritz the Cat had been the first animation to receive an X rating. Bakshi gave me a super funny script, but nothing ever materialized. I think he might have wanted to get in my pants, which did not happen, surprisingly. Mm 
Paramount made billions. Paramount made, had made billions from the Eddie Murphy movie. When Beverly Hills Cop 2 opened with a record-breaking $26.4 million box office, Bob Wax to a huge celebration for Eddie at his house in Beverly Hills. It was my first big Hollywood party, an all-day barbecue featuring all-day drinking. I felt a bit out of place and did not socialize much. However, I managed to go down two margaritas when I arrived, drank a couple of glasses of red wine with dinner, and, when they brought out the giant cake, enjoyed a few goblets of champagne. When it was time to go, Tess put me in my Mazda and asked if I was okay, which I felt I was, until driving back home to the valley, I tackled the curving roller coaster that is Cold Water Canyon. I had to pull over twice to pee and vomit in the dark bushes. It was the first time I knew what blind drunk meant. I could only see the yellow lines, and I followed them slowly all the way to my right turn on victory and left on truth. When I stumbled into the small apartment, Roxanne said, Damn, Jenny, you smell like a distillery. After a few months, I began to get anxious about work. I wasn't getting cash in anything. A big mouth and a deep back band weren't cutting it in Hollywood. I had signed with ICM for movie and TV work on the West Coast, but a string of unsuccessful auditions led Ivers Grossman, my agent, to tell me to get out of the business. This is not exactly what you want to hear from your agent. Tess was also getting frustrated with my failure to secure any job. Clutching at straws, she bitterly told me I needed to lose weight. You're in Hollywood now. I wasn't obese by any stretch, not even chubby. In fact, my strength and flexibility were two great assets that had served me well, but the pressure to meet the size two Hollywood standard was real. I questioned more and more if I could cope because I was not centered and prepared or prepared. I had not yet trained to audition for screen roles. I was used to playing to live audiences, and now I had to pull everything back for the camera. And I hadn't acted in a long time. To develop a character for a role required more focus than my scattered mind was able to muster. I found it difficult to concentrate. My mind was always racing off on tangents. I don't see how, because acting on Broadway, you have to get in character for a role. Um, I came home sick for New York City. I especially wanted to be in Central Park Sheep Meadow in mid-August to participate in the global meditation marketing, the harmonic convergence, a big event in the New Age movement. The importance of the date had to do with the Mayan calendar and a prediction of something big and transformative happening, signaled by an alignment of the sun and planets on August 16, 1987. Some believe the spectacle will usher in a new era for humanity. Well, that turned out to be bullshit. The first thing I did when I returned to New York was see Thomas. So being with him was a drag. And he was really worried that we would never get married because now I was living in Los Angeles. But he was still telling me not to curse and act like a lady. Thomas had good reason to be worried. I was jetting back and forth between the East and West Coast for auditions and meetings, taking acting classes, performing in nightclubs, and sleeping with a few other guys in New York and Los Angeles. The harmonic convergence did not seem to extend to my crazed ass. To relieve my anxiety and try to get a grip of my life, I continued to search for answers by immersing myself in popular spirituality, rolfing, crystals, chakra cleansing, totems, channeling, past life regression, and on and on. I reread Mandino's The Greatest Salesman and became motivated by Shakti Gawain's creative visualization, which spelled out how to manifest your dreams. A few of these approaches helped me immensely, although they didn't solve the underlying problem. I also was consuming titles such as The Overcoming, Overcoming the Fear of Success by Martha Friedman and Love Yourself into Life by Jay Z Knight. I had begun to build my West Coast quarrel of lovers. First with a man named Tim who pulled out his huge dick and said, Not bad for a white guy, huh? After Tim, my stable of men grew as I began to date Gary, a musician, as well as Aaron, Jeff, and Peter. Dick. The men weren't human. They were my tool, my drug. My need for the euphoria of the orgasm was acute. I was starting to think there was something off about my behavior, but I felt compelled to have sex. It was the best way I knew how to calm my anxiety. Mm. This takes me to one of my poems in my book, The Celibacy Chronicles. Um, fornication was one of the only ways I knew to connect. It didn't require much reflection. Impulse action was enough to gain satisfaction. Liquid libations always assisted lust to leap faster. Had to have it. Was never not an option. There's multiple choices of boys' numbers in my phone. Who would get a ring today? Certainly not me. A future possibility wasn't enough to be waiting around on something not guaranteed. And to be honest, I don't know if marriage is cut out for me. 
We'll leave it at that. I love this, Jennifer. It's such a relatable topic. What she's talking about, what she was going through, a lot of us utilize other means to escape and not deal with the underlying or the root issue of stuff. We'll abuse sex. We'll abuse food. We'll uh, abuse shopping. We'll be just talking to people, just calling and talking to somebody every day, just never having a silent moment to yourself, watching TV, watching something on the Internet, talking to people, and just not centering yourself. All of these are distractions that keep you from getting to the root of who you are. Sometimes you just have to sit in silence. You have to cry. You have to write, sit by fire. You have to do whatever you have to do to allow those emotions to feel them and to understand them and get through them, seeking the therapist. I'm talking to myself. That's how I know. So she said, I was starting to think there was something off about my behavior, but I felt compelled to have sex. It was the best way I knew how to calm my anxiety. I could no longer deny the fact that I was fucked up in deep fundamental ways that were too overwhelming to contemplate. It was becoming more difficult to overlook my extreme abiding depression or to deny that my clowning and promiscuity were, in fact, inappropriate behavior. I wanted to be different, to take control of my life, and I did find hope. Many of the books I read gave me new perspectives and new self-help tools for becoming the person I wanted to be. The Seth books by Jane Roberts were hugely important to me. The things they addressed made me increasingly convinced that maintaining positivity and staying focused on what I wanted instead of what I did not want would enable me, would enable me to manifest the life I sought. My metaphysical studies taught me that energy is highest where the water meets the land. So I booked myself for a weekend at Gurney's Inn, a historic spa resort in Montauk, on the tip of Long Island, New York. The sunset was magical as I stood on the rocky shoreline. It seemed the perfect setting for manifesting, and each time the waves crashed against the rocks, I shouted, I want a job in Hollywood. The next day, I lay in a darkened spa room, mummy-like in a seaweed mineral wrap. I heard the attendant enter, sensed the bend, sensed her bend in close to me and softly whispered, Someone is calling from Los Angeles, Miss Lewis. I believe it's Hollywood. The moment felt just like one of those scenes in an old movie where the actress gets the call that changes her life. Hollywood calling. The attendant had a phone on a long cord and held the receiver to my ear as I said, Hello, through the mud that restricted my face. Bob Wax was on the line, shouting from excitement that I had to catch the earliest flight to Los Angeles because a producer named Hayne Saban wanted me to audition for a pilot called Love Sports. There was a limo already waiting for me, which drove me back to my apartment and idled at the curb while I hurriedly packed. On the way to JFK Airport, I had the limo stop briefly at Thomas's apartment to pick up a few things I had left there. Thomas said, how long will you be gone this time? I said, baby, this might be it. I saw his face and thought to myself, let the fucking limo wait. I held his face in my hands and kissed him. He drew back just a little. I could see he was trying to cover the heartbreak he was feeling. I felt bad, but I didn't feel horrible because I had never lied to him. He knew this day would come. We had a sweet and powerful quickie, and like the gentleman he always was, he carried my luggage to the limo and waved me off. You're wondering if I cried in that limo. The answer is yes, and the five hours on the fucking plane. I had just ended a seven-year relationship, and by the time I got back to Roxanne's apartment, my whole body was itching. The next morning, I broke out in red welts and my entire body was sore. This had never happened to me before. I was sure it was AIDS. I couldn't go get to the doctor fast enough. Roxanne and I were holding hands when the doctor came into the room. He asked me if I had been under heavy stress. She probably just got high. I looked at him like he was a damn fool and told him I had just gotten a divorce. He said, well, this is very common. You have shingles. I had remember playing hopscotch with corn shingles from my rooftop and Kenlock made out of sand and tar. Good Lord, what a come around and what a hideous name for a hideous ailment. I proceeded to skip my happy, itchy ass to the car and took my scratchy, itchy ass home. <laughs> From the Los Angeles Times, November 27, 1987, Jennifer Lewis has been appointed to the Bench in Love Court, a new syndicated half-hour series to premiere in September 1988. Lewis, an actress with a sense of opinions to couples wrangling over romantic problems. The series is described as a comedy takeoff of divorce of TV's Divorce Court, Peace of Court, Superior Court, and Love Connection. And here it was my first television gig. After we shot the pilot for Love Court, things got really busy for me over the next month, but not in Hollywood. Once again, Irv Rebel came to me with a great opportunity, this time a concert in Paris, featuring me and several wonderful singers, Sharon McKnight, Lena Cat Pass, Naomi Moody, and Nancy Lamont. On the way to Paris, I stopped in New York for a few days, and Thomas asked me to marry him. I said yes. 
What the hell? She kept saying this Dominican dude, Miguel, been asking her to marry him, and she said no. And this is her love of her life. Like, what's the deal? I just gonna tell another man yes, and she already had another man. What did you got going on? I said yes. When I told Mama, she said, there's no way you're marrying anybody. While in Paris, I became friendly with our pianist, Michael Sloth, and his wife, Marta Kaufman. When we got back to the States, Marta and her creative partner, David Crane, cast me in a musical called Let Freedom Sing, which played in Philly and then at the Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C. Completely forgetting I was engaged, I simply couldn't resist the adorable... <laughs> oh my God, Jennifer. Completely forgetting I was engaged, I simply resist... I simply couldn't resist the adorable young doorman at the Kennedy Center. I was his I I was his first and I pitied the poor girl who was his second. Nobody could follow the acrobatic I perform after he escorted me into an elevator and I pulled the stop button. She was wild, good lord. I returned to LA and had good auditions for shows on CBS and ABC and at MTM, which was Mary Tyler Moore's production company. It was disappointing when the Love Court pilot didn't get picked up, but nonetheless, things were moving in the right direction and stardom seemed within reach. More opportunities came along, including a pilot with Eddie Murphy called What's Allen Watching, which unfortunately did not make it to the airwaves. Around this time, I went on a date with Eddie's brother, Charlie Murphy. I swear I didn't touch him, y'all. We laughed so much, I think we just forgot the screw. And Mark. Good Lord. In March 1990, I was cast in my first regular television role on Crosstown. The series star was Tony Alda of the famous Alda acting family. I was nervous as hell. It was the first time I had acted on camera on a consistent basis. During the second day of filming, the, the, re la, 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 the director stopped me mid-scene. He shouted, what are you doing? This is a sound stage, not a theater stage. I have been trained to hit the back of a row of a large theater. We are. Us actors, us lesbians, when we're on stage, is much different than on camera. I have more um, experience with stage acting. Um, I am in a film. Oh, yeah. If you got to be, everybody got to be a free. Um, check out this movie called Sacred Past. I play the baby mother to one of the main characters. He's trying to figure out his past of, of good or bad. Um, and, yeah. So he comes and confides in me. And he lies to me. So go check that out. It's called Sacred Path on Tubi. So that was my... Was that my first? I don't think that was my first recorded gig. My first film. But it's one of the first. Um, I'm, I have way more experience in stage acting. And yeah, they teach us to project. So the audience has to hear and feel you. It's way... You know, a live show if you've ever been to a live play. And if you haven't, you should you should treat yourself to one. It's very different. That's... I, that, that's why I would like to say some of the real actors come through. Some people you probably never met and won't see on TV are stage um, actors in Broadway, and they put on a show. And it's it's just different dynamics um, for stage acting than uh, film actor. Film acting, you can stop, cut, do your line. Stage is very live, it's very right now, it's very organic. Um, it can be a little, you know, anxiety driven for the actor, but it's very fun. All right. Um, so, he said, you know, this, what are you doing? This is a sound stage, not a theater stage. I had been trained to hit the back row of a large theater, but when the director showed me the footage of my performance, the problem was clear. I came across loud, over-the-top, exaggerated, like a kabuki actor among regular people. The camera is intimate. It seems more keenly than the eyes of an audience ten feet away. On stage, you have to tell the truth. On camera, you have to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Anything less comes across as fake acting. We call it acting. I realized that in order to deliver the much that much truth, I had to know the truth of who I was. It meant I had to take that journey within. I wanted to please the director. I wanted to be a, as great in Hollywood as I've been in college and on Broadway. I had to play to the intimacy of a camera and a few people in my face, not a cabaret full of night covers at a distance. I listened as the Crosstown directors helped me, and I did the work. I dove all the way in, and it was a hell of a transition. Stanislavski, The Method, acting classes with the brilliant Janet Alhanti served as a sort of therapy for me because I was forced to examine my emotions in order to create authentic emotions for the characters I played. The greatest method actors achieve unity with their characters. 
Marlon Brando, Denzel Washington, Viola Davis. They say Robert De Niro comes to set with a stack of index cards and notes he has rooted out about his character. I focus on my Crosstown character. How could I create her truth? I was so proud the same I was so proud the day that same director yelled, Cut then smiled at me. Very good, Jennifer. Working on a TV series is no joke. Like running a marathon every day. Great actors can make it look easy. Trust me, it is not. Sometimes we start at five or six in the morning and shoot two episodes in a single day. A couple of times Tony Alba and I stayed at the studio overnight. I was exhausted during cross town, but I was very happy. Despite our failed engagement, Thomas and I were still on the make up the break up treadmill. We flew to Hawaii together for a vacation, hoping the beautiful setting will help heal our differences. Conveniently, we both forgot that our trip to Jamaica had failed at achieving that goal. We boarded a helicopter to sightsee over Kauai. The helicopter lowered itself down into the canyon, surrounded by all sizes and types of waterfalls, absolutely gorgeous. Then, as the helicopter ascended upward, the song, Love Lift Us, Up Where We Belong, blasted through the headphones they had given us. It was utterly breathtaking and romantic. I reached my right hand to take his left. Thomas was left-handed, and when I didn't feel his sweet fingers reach back for mine, I turned to discover he was writing a note. I remember mouthing to him over the music. What are you writing? He said, I just want to remember to tell my mother what I saw today. God help me. His mama always came first. Would I ever really able to be number two for any man? I'm going to let y'all answer that and keep it moving. I came to find the scenic hills and dramatic ocean views on the west coast calming to my soul. They say nobody walks in Los Angeles, but none of the joys of living here is hiking. From my first days as a resident, when I felt confused, I would hike the mountains. Wait a minute, let me back up, I read that wrong. They say nobody walks in Los Angeles, but one of the joys of living here is hiking. From my first days as a resident, when I felt confused, I would hike the mountains that frame the San Fernando Valley, sometimes singing a song that was a favorite when I was a little girl. Climb every mountain, ford every stream, follow every rainbow till you find your dream. I choose the steepest slope, singing the gospel phrase I love that went, God give me mountains with hills at their knees, mountains too high for the flutter of trees. God give me mountains and the strength to climb them. This was a soul-searching time for me. I thought to be more connected to nature, to pay more attention to sunsets and the rising of the moon. That's, that's my vibe. That's what gets me. I love being outside. I'm about to go outside when I get done with this. I'll be out there for hours, like, that's just, I don't know. There's something about being tuned in with nature. You just feel connected to, to, to the creator. I mean, we are a reflection of that. And this message is brought to you by Live Alkaline Water, the best hydration in the nation. Black-owned water from black-owned indigenous land out of North Carolina. Um, I sell these in bottles. We also have gallons. We do five gallons. We ship uh, we're mostly, like I said, the land is in North Carolina, so my brothers back home, they mostly are doing upper middle east coast, so like Maryland, D.C., Philly, we got some plugs down in Atlanta, um, but I'm in Jacksonville, Florida, so I will be getting some more of these down here so that those in this area can, um, get in on the goodness of the best hydration in the nation and support black owned. But yeah, getting in nature is like that. We um got to get off these phones and off this internet and, and away from people sometimes. And just go deep breathe. It's a lot of beautiful things out in nature that we'll never see. I'll be seeing a lot of butterflies out here. I've seen a bird eat a butterfly. I'll be coming across all types of plants. I grow a garden too, so I'll be growing. Just to see life produce itself, it don't get no better. So she said, I thought to be more connected to nature to pay more attention to sunsets and the rising of the moon. I'm about to say I am a little hot. One moment. Ooh. There we go. All right, all right. I ran into Bet one day while hiking the Hollywood Reservoir, Bet Miller. Reservoir with my friend, Psalm, Tom Fennessy. She had just started working on a new movie, which turned out to be Beaches. She got me a featured role in a number written by Mark Scheinman called Auto Pistling, a fictional account of the invention of the bra. <laughs> bra, what bra? Um, wherein my already oversized bosom was costumed in an outrageously huge poppy. During a break, Mark Bet and I walked onto Wilshire Boulevard, still in full costume. I stepped to the curb where I pretended to hitchhike while bouncing up and down to jiggle the enormous breast. 
We three fell out at the faces of the passing drivers. When I wasn't working, I grasped for anything that might help me feel whole. Crystals, face reading, moon bath, the Ouija board. What a mess I was. Longing for Thomas, longing for Miguel, confused as to why I was not elated at the progress of my career. God help me. Nothing was ever enough. And, of course, it didn't help that I was having sex with far too many men. Adam, Tim, Tucker, and Eddie. Green, not Murphy. Tucker introduced me to porn, but I never really liked it. It gave me a headache. The video showed too much banging and not enough foreplay. The action always looked painful to me. Okay, maybe I like to see a little hair pulling, but not all that oversized extra. You know you're bored with, with porn when you find yourself criticizing the acting skills of the participants. Tucker also introduced me to the waterbed thing. He liked waterbeds because he had back problems courtesy of the Vietnam War. All that splashing around spoiled the rhythm. I pretended to fall on the floor so we could finish up on solid ground. I discovered how annoying it was to have sex wearing lead press on them. I had to wear them to television shows, but they made sex difficult. A few men complained, poor bastards. I flew to New York for an audition, and while I was there, made my appearance at a few of my old hearts, including possible twins. Journal entry. Rude waitress tells me Elaine Swain is dead. Horrible moment. I returned to the West Coast and was in a downward spiral for weeks. The inevitable breaking point came after a huge long-distance fight with Thomas the day before I had an important audition for a role on 30 Something, the drama series about Yuppie Ain't that was the hottest show on television at the time. I was already in emotional distress when I arrived for the audition at a nondescript office building. My scene was with Peter Horton, the director, and one of the show's stars. Right from the start, things went south. I was auditioning for the character of Rosie, but I was drowning in the character of Jennifer Lewis and wearing a mask. I felt like my entire career depended on this one audition, a crushing weight that made it impossible for me to focus on the character or remember the lines. I became overwrought, and for the first time in my life, I said, I can't do it. Peter Horton was lovely. Yes, you can, Jennifer. I started over, but simply could not get the words out. I thanked Peter and, barely holding myself together, walked blindly out of the room. As soon as I stepped into the elevator, I completely lost all control, sobbing and gulping as I slid down the wall and melted into a puddle on the floor. The suit-clad people in the little compartment just looked at me. Back in my mind, and still sobbing uncontrollably, I could barely see the road as I drove through Laurel Canyon. When the red light stopped me at Ventura Boulevard, I collapsed on the steering wheel. I looked up when I heard two beats from the car adjacent to mine. The older white driver looked at me compassionately, and I could see him mouth, I'm sorry. It was just the sweetest little toot toot on his horn and a simple acknowledgement. I had been seen by the stranger and it uplifted me, just enough to get home. Everything was crashing in on me. I spent a lot of time alone watching rent movies on my VCR. One of these was Francis, starring Jessica Lane. It was about Francis Farmer, a mostly B-movie actor during the 1930s and 40s. Sadly, she is famous largely for having been the victim of an involuntary lobotomy following a diagnosis of manic depressive disorder. From the first scene, Lane's brilliant portrayal of Frances Farmer's descent into mental illness triggered recognition in me, especially her crippling depression, the dark cloud that lay over her very existence, her impatience and impulsiveness, her loneliness, her inability to handle failure, her blaming others for her own mistakes. It was all familiar. I cried through the entire movie. Subconsciously, I knew it was my story, but still, I did not, could not acknowledge that I, too, could be mentally ill. I turned the video off with one thought. Damn. I don't want to be like that. I never mentioned my reaction to Francis to anyone. I convinced myself that I could make myself better on my own and continue to search for answers in metaphysical spirituality. Around this time, I got a call from Shirley LaFleur, Le the Dean of Students, while I was at Webster. Shirley, a wonderful poet and excellent dean, had been extremely supportive of me in college. As a freshman, I went to her office in tears because every time I do something that gets applause, people feel it. Shirley didn't make fun or patron make fun of or patronize me. Instead, she said, Jennifer, you should be flattered because by the time they've stolen your material, you're, you've gone on to create something new anyway. Shirley was my connection to Beverly Heath. They had been best friends in St. Louis. Shirley had flown out to Beverly's house in Pasadena for a few days. Like me, 